Yes, I uh, will now hand over to the stars of the show, uh, Chris and, uh, and Brendan. Thank you. share it with us. So, early days. Brennan and I both grew up in Sydney. Uh, but with... <laughs> but uh, with vastly different childhoods. Uh, me in the inner city and Brendan in the foothills of the Blue Mountains. Um, so, for me, my only really real exposure to reptiles in the early days was through books and field guides. Uh, Brendan got to spend his youth running through the bush looking for snakes and lizards. Pretty sure Stu just materialised as an 18 year old. But before there was Facebook, it was Aussie pythons and snakes. And that's what brought Brendan and I together. On a fateful day at the Aussie pythons and snakes Christmas party, uh, Brendan, Tom and I met for the first time. And I vividly remember it. It was the first time I'd ever met anyone my age or roughly my age that knew more than reptiles about me. And I still remember sitting in the back of the train uh, while Brendan and Tom spoke about the reptiles using their scientific names while I nodded along pretending to know what they were talking about. Uh, but we had a great time and I would uh, regularly catch them out, uh, the train up to the Blue Mountains to go looking for snakes with Tom and Brendan. That's the Lawson Tim spot. That's secret spot. The <laughs> <laughs> never will find it. Uh, and while we were on these trips in the Blue Mountains, we would regularly be dreaming about reptiles in Northern Australia and we'd be form formulating plans to get up there. Um, and uh, cheekily, we uh, at 15 decided to take a sneaky trip up there and pulled our money and bought f flights up to uh, the top end to spend a week with someone we met on the internet uh, who was a barely legal driver and we were young and naive enough to have no idea how much danger we were in. Not because he was a random person off the internet, but because he could hardly drive. Yeah. I'd like been up there the year before at six months before and so I knew he was actually someone our age. He wasn't a 45 year old man. <laughs> but at one stage we were driving back into Adelaide River. He, he was uh, 17 I think. He had just gotten his red peas before uh, Brendan and I got up there. And he was driving along the road. Obviously in those days there was no speed limits on the highways in the NT. He was going about 160 and uh, we get pulled over by the NT cops. And they pull us over and they go, and, and, and the guy that we're with says, what's the problem officer? There's no speed limits on the NT roads. And he said, yeah, that, that, that's right, but you're on your red peas so your limit is 90 and you're going 160. Uh, and in good old NT cop fashion, he just let us keep going. <laughs> <laughs> 70 k's over is a bit fast, mate. Right? Just take it. Just take it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that was, a, that, was, that was our early days. Um, and, you know, back then we were searching all the places that we search these days, but with dolphin torches, dolphin. without head torches. <laughs> and um, we found in, an incredible diversity of reptile and, reptiles and it got us hooked but we really didn't find anywhere near as many as we could have had we had the skill and technology that's available today. Um, so from there, uh, after school, our paths deviated. Uh, Brendan uh, followed zookeeping up to Cairns and then eventually Darwin, uh, but I took an academic route and stayed in Sydney, but with regular trips north uh, with Tom and Brendan to look for large tropical snakes. And then after that, move on a few years, we're both professional ecologists. And uh, other than digging pit traps and lugging uh, Elliot traps around the bush, by and large, uh, the main part of our job was identifying species. If you want to uh, track differences in species composition between habitats, 
the effects of mining in uh, uh, clearing for mining or uh, look at uh, the differences in animal compositions between burnt and unburnt sites. What you have to be able to do is identify the species that you find. So it's during this period that the, uh, that the uh, utility of field guides really came into the fore for us. And, um, and while most of our work was in Eastern Australia, and we, are spoiled for, we were spoiled for choice for great herpetological field guides in Eastern Australia, uh, we really had very little resources in Northern Australia. And I vividly remember uh, when I first did my first survey with the NT uh, Government Flora and Fauna Department in Kakadu, where I caught this little skink, and I, uh, I, 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 I wanted to know, was it the uh, skink named, uh, that shared its name with our, my wonderful wife, Alana, um, Manisha Alame, or was it a boring old Manisha Mani? And so I requested uh, the resource, a resource to identify this lizard from the field trip leader. And to my abject horror, I was handed a binded folder of illicit copies of Cogger, uh, random pages from uh, Paul Horner's Sphinx of the NT, and random description papers. And they said, here you go, identify a lizard. And, uh, <laughs> and I was just like, what the hell is going on? This can't be the best we have here. Uh, and I, and I, I remember, I drove, and Brendan and I were looking at the text messages, the origin of the book, just yesterday. And I contacted Brendan and I said, uh, the NT, uh, initially I said we should do a, a field guide to the top end. And Brendan uh, very naively suggested, why don't we just do it for the whole of the NT? Uh, which obviously didn't make a whole lot more sense. But um, yeah, and so that, that's the origin story. Um, and, uh, but I suppose we should tell you a little bit about the Northern Territory. If the NT is anything, it is vast and remote. It's 20% uh, of Australia's land area with 1% of the human population. Uh, so the vast majority of the NT doesn't have any people. It doesn't have any roads uh, and it's incredibly hard to get around. Yet, despite it only being 20% of the land area of Australia, it's 40% of this Australia's reptile diversity. So 139 species as it stands, uh, and all 390, <laughs> sorry, 390, uh, and all reptile species, are, uh, all reptile families are, um, occur in the NT. And it's a land of extremes. It's a huge distance from the top <laughs> to the bottom. And the uh, tropical north is dominated by savannas. Uh, but also it has uh, monsoon vine thickets, rugged escarpments, and sprawling floodplains. And then as you go further south, you move into the arid interior. On the edge, you've got the Barclay uh, Black Soil Plains and the stony, semi-arid deserts, through the arid escarpments, down to the dune fields of the very south. And uh, as you can see, it's broken up into 25 distinct bioregions. And each of these regions has a distinct climate, uh, topography, and, uh, and uh, flora, which then um, makes the fauna dramatically different. And uh, you'll notice that, unfortunately for us, these bioregions don't stop at the NT borders, so uh, it makes things a little bit more complicated. So, you want to start a field guide. What do you, what do, you do? You have to get a species list going. And uh, fortunately for us, we were thinking, you know, we need a species list. Uh, how are we going to do this? Ah, we know Stuart McDonald, and Stuart McDonald just happens to have a website that's done all of that for us. Uh, and so Stuart had, uh, runs, the, runs a Rod and ha is just like an absolute genius when it comes to uh, databases and uh, technical details like that. And so we were able to start putting together a list of all the reptiles that immediately when I suggested the book and uh, to Brendan, and he's, the first thing he said was, I'm already dreading writing the species profiles. We uh, came up with this, uh, a start of a list of what species occurs in the NT. But to get a list, <coughs> I just need a quick drink. <coughs> to get a list of reptiles, you kind of um, uh, have two big problems. Taxonomy, what, taxon what taxonomy are you gonna use? 
Uh, you're going to stick with uh, the field guides that are currently published uh, or use international databases or use the local databases. And we were kind of flying blind when we started the field guide. Uh, we started just uh, going along the same route as other field guides, uh, but some of the things in those field guides weren't making complete sense to us. So we kind of made our own decisions along the way. Uh, by the end, uh, we, uh, when we finally submitted the book, uh, within weeks of submitting that book, the ASH official list of Australian species came out, which uh, could have been very handy much earlier on in the book. Uh, <laughs> but by and large, our list matched theirs perfectly. So it was, it was, uh, it was quite good. Uh, here's a little story about how taxonomy can really uh, be a little bit tricky, and uh, understanding species distributions are quite tricky. Um, so, I'm sure everyone's heard about the Tim Panacryptus uh, rediscovery in uh, Melbourne in the last, uh, well, announced this week, but it, yeah, like I said, six months ago. We've got a very similar situation in NT. Uh, the even scaled uh, Eelis dragon is this little lizard that's only known from this one specimen. It's a specimen that was collected in 1911. And if you, if you have a look at the type description, it says uh, the only specimen was taken near Darwin in the Northern Territories. Where is near Darwin in 1911? Uh, and so people will, uh, there's no Tim Panacryptus near Darwin. So uh, the, as far as we can find, the closest I've found Tim Panacryptus to Darwin is Catherine, which is, you know, not near Darwin uh, today. Uh, but this little guy, uh, from the Victoria River District kind of matches the description of this as having a s relatively smooth back. And for a long time, uh, Wilson and Swan and every everyone else assumed that Tympanic Rictus uniformis occurred in the Victoria River District where lizards that look like the holotype live. However, since then, uh, Jay Melville has done a bunch of uh, genetic sampling all through that area and you get spiny little ones like the guy in the middle and you get smooth back ones and they all come out as uh, Tim Panacryptus um, macra, well, that, which has since been raised to Tim Panacryptus macra. Uh, so what we thought was Tim Panacryptus uniformis is not Tim Panacryptus uniformis, but we have no way really to resolve this. So all we could do in our field guide is say this uh, specimen came from near Darwin, uh, but as far as we know, this could be one of those lizards that just doesn't exist. Um, potentially, it was found from uh, an area much further south, and it's described based on just based on um, morphology. <coughs> Until we can get some genetic material from that holotype, we've got no way of knowing whether that is macra or if uh, uniformis is not a real species or not. Turtles, turtles are a fucking nightmare. Uh, Chris, they, uh, I, had, I didn't have a huge amount of love for turtles to begin with, and I had much less love for them while I was putting together their species profiles. Uh, so for a group of animals with such few species, there's an incredible amount of disharmony between people on their taxonomy. So we just followed what Wilson and Swan did and uh, used their turtle taxonomy, submitted the book. A couple of months later, the World uh, Turtle Taxonomic Guide came out uh, and the Australian expert, I won't mention his name, sort of followed the same lines with a few differences. So we said, can we retract that chapter, please? Saro Publishing, and they said, yes, be our guest, uh, we'll retract that. And so we changed all the taxonomy of turtles Shortly after that, the ash list came out with the same turtle expert having very different taxonomic decisions. So we had to retract that chapter again. And uh, so these two turtles on the left, red uh short neck turtles, were split into two species and then put back together, split and then put back together. And we ended up just calling the Victoria everywhere. And uh, the, the northern long neck turtle is just uh, rugosa throughout the top end, according to our book. Just let me know and care about the yeah. turtles. Thank you. Spent <laughs> <laughs> way too much time thinking about it. Except Angus. <laughs> so, how do you make maps for a field guide? Um, 
this is really where having Stuart as a co-author in the book came to the fore. Uh, Stuart had this amazing website, A-Rod, and in the back, running behind A-Rod, you see these maps, what you don't realise is it's this database of species records in a user-friendly uh, website where you can just edit the distribution using polygons and um, just drag all of these dots around the map. And uh, Brendan and I spent hours painstakingly, like for example, with the uh, Plains Death out of that, uh, in the south of its range. It just occurs in the Barclay Table Line black soil. We painstakingly traced around all of those black soil plains that you can see there. And then uh, finally, when the ma maps were reproduced uh, in the, the right version for the field guide, it's the size of a postage stamp, and we realised that that really wasn't necessary. We did warn us, but only after we'd done most of the maps. <laughs> <laughs> but what's great about this system is that uh, as we have people coming and saying, now that they're looking through the book, oh, I've actually found that skink on the Tiwis, uh, but never reported the record. We can simply just drag that polygon to the Tiwis, and then the next time we, uh, unfortunately, uh, the next time, we uh, <laughs> make a new edition of the book, and we can just reproduce all those maps, and it will fill all those. Uh, it's uh, a program that Stu developed, because he wasn't happy with the available mapping program. So, yes. in, like most things Stu does, it's just incredibly user-friendly. Yeah. It's great. So that's why the species that we really do understand the distributions of. But the bike, one thing that you learn uh, writing a field guide, when we started it, uh, when I was talking to Brendan, we, we kind of were like, ah, oh, it's essentially just summarising information, right? Like get it, making it into a user-friendly format while making heaps and heaps of money. Um, and uh, very quickly we realised how we no, we, we, we always knew there'd be no money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, we didn't know that. Um, but uh, I genuinely thought that the information was out there. And it wasn't until we started looking that we realised how very little information there is on the vast majority of species. There was nothing to summarise uh, most of these species are known from early descriptions that were very vague uh, and uh, since then there hasn't been a whole lot documented about them and so we don't know anything about the habitat associations um, and a, a lot of the uh, species records are unclear and dubious and so it took us, uh, we spent a lot of time going through records and vetting them and weeding out the ones that uh, just didn't make sense going to the museum, cross-referencing uh, specimens and like really trying to get uh, a handle for one, how to identify these species uh, against their uh, similar species, but two, also really refine where they actually occur so we can describe the habitat they're associated with and also their distributions. Um, and this took a lot of time poring over old uh, description papers and in the museum, but eventually there's only so much you can do and you really need to get in the field uh, to, um, to find out the rest. So I think it's about time we uh, talk about uh, looking for reptiles in the NT. Let's take a bit of a tour of the topic. So when people think of the Northern Territory, the first thing they typically think of is Kakadu National Park. It's the largest national park in Australia, it's, uh, it's quite a brutal place a lot of the time of the year. It's uh, mostly vast savannas um, and these large, unforgiving rivers, massive floodplains, high, and high diversity of habitat types. And when people think of Kakadu, when tourists uh, from overseas and local uh, think of Kakadu, the first thing they think of is to notice. <laughs> and Kakadu, if it's good for one, it's good for to notice. You've got the gravel lovers. You've got the sand runners. You've got the big ones. You've got the rock ones. And you've got the everywhere to notice. And while that's a little bit tongue in cheek, it is. Kakadu is actually an incredible place like that. So. Those to notice will occur on one side of the river from the other in essentially the same habitat, 
but you just cross the Mary, uh, the, the Wildman River, and you've got one species of tenotus on gravel <coughs> and not the other side of the river. And uh, and you can you can go to Kakadu a thousand times and still be finding new reptiles. And and uh, it, it, it's it's a very frustrating place to look for reptiles because it keeps its secrets close to its chest. But it's what keeps you going back. Um, an example of this is the Arnhem Land Gorgeous skin. So this lizard was first found in 1975 uh, at Nowalanja and initially was thought to be a major skink, uh, but was described thereafter uh, twice, uh, once by Lewis and Wellington and once by Ross Sadlier. Uh, and, uh, but, but since this description in 1975, there's only 40 records. There's sometimes been a decade between records and, and it, it recently it was listed as one of the most likely lizards to go extinct in the Northern Territory. Uh, this thing's like the size of a blue tongue. It's hard, you'd think it'd be uh, a hard thing to miss. Uh, but when I started my PhD in Southern Kakadu, I got word that a tail of a lizard had been seen near one of my study sites. And so I made it my mission to befriend these lizards. So I drove into Catherine and I got a bag of uh, frozen berries and I sat at this crevice day after day, throwing in frozen berries. And sure enough, I did befriend these guys. And, uh, and, and you know, just, that, we really knew nothing about these lizards before that, uh, very, very little anyway. And through uh, spending that time and getting to know them, we've since managed to leverage uh, a bunch of conservation funding for this lizard. It, it, it sort of, it, its profile got raised and then we managed to get money to go searching for it across Kakadu. You know, this is the one place the lizard had been seen from for the last, uh, 15, 20 years, uh, and uh, very few records across the, across the park. Uh, but since then, we've gone out and put cameras throughout the park. And uh, of the seven uh, historic locations with camera traps out there, we've managed to get them at five of those locations. So despite these areas being heavily frequented by tourists, they're just extremely cryptic. And it's just classic Kakadu to keep its secrets that close to its chest. It probably also most active, uh, like a gurney of Douglas I and Kimberley that were also pretty much absent for, for the last couple of decades. Um, they're mostly active in warmer times of the year when it's uncomfortable for people, for people to be in Kakadu or access is limited because of the wet season. So you've got that working into it as well. So, I mean, I saw this one in, when was that? It was like late November, it's stinking hot. The first is sitting out. Uh, yeah, well, I've Kakadu. done, I don't remember how many trips to Kakadu, and apart from Chris's pet ones, that's the only one I've seen. <laughs> so, <laughs> but actually, like, very from, from our camera track data, I can tell you they are just active in the wet season. And yeah. they're also active, uh, they're thought to be crispuscular, right? Our camera tra track data shows they are active through the middle of the day. So they're, they're, they're like full of surprises, and they're only to be seen when you're not actually standing there looking for them. Uh, Stuart. So, a bit of a backstory here. I've lived in, I've been living in Darwin for a few years. I think the first time Chris and I looked for Owen Pelly pythons, which are this, well, one of the rarest pythons in the world, uh, which is surprising because they're such a big snake, you think they wouldn't, wouldn't be too hard to find, but they're just very elusive uh, in the Cactus Gut. And I think. During the time I lived in Darwin, I worked out I spent at least 80 nights out in Kakadu looking for them and failing to see them. Um, prior to that, so I'd only been there for six months or so, Stuart McDonald came to visit in 2010. Uh, the following night he went out to Kakadu and he found an Owen Pelly pipe and it had a huge food item in its gut. And he said, he called up and said, look, it's probably going to be here tomorrow night. You and Tom Parkins should come out and find it. Bugger that, we want to find our own one. Like, we don't want to be shown an Owen Pelly python. <laughs> I didn't realise I wouldn't see one until last year. Uh, and I think Chris had a similar experience, that right? Yeah, Stuart was a house guest and he went into Kakadu uh, without us and found an Owen Pelly python on his uh, journey into Kakadu. Uh, so, yeah, don't, don't, uh, when Stuart heads into Kakadu while he's staying with you, go off. 
<laughs> yeah, he's only been there twice. <laughs> no, but they're, they're an amazing snake. Obviously, this is a thing that nearly everyone thinks of when, when they think of Kaku National Park. And Are you sure it's not to notice? <laughs> well, it depends who you talk to, but to notice are great. I'm fairly positive. All right, coastal typhoons. So, um, coastal typhoons in the Northern Territory are almost as mythical as on Pelly Pythons. Um, on the East Coast, or at least in areas of, of North Queensland, they're actually quite common. They're just very elusive, and uh, there's certain times of the year when they're very active, and you can go out and find multiple typhoons a day. You just have to be in the right area at the right time, like most snakes. But, and that was one of the main reasons that things that took me to North Queensland, rather than zookeeping, that was just an interesting job to do while looking for typhoons. So um, Tom Parkin and I particularly spent a lot of time looking for typhoons. We, and we worked out certain things. Um, they're most, well, they're, the trigger for them to mate seems to be these cold nights um, throughout the cooler months of the year in the dry season, followed by like clear, almost windless days is, is what you want. Um, and on those days, they're, like you can see a few typhoons. Um, now, going over to the Kimberley, so in 2010 I started working with Henry Cook, in, uh, who's sitting over here, in the North Kimberley doing monitoring surveys and those surveys have been going on for, what, six years at that point? Or four years or so? Uh, no one has seen years. a typhoon. No longer, I think. No, uh, no one has seen a typhoon up there at least on feeder for, I think the person who'd seen one was Butch's dad. Yeah, in the and early Butch 90s. must be 70 now. So in the early 90s, someone had seen one well, in the generation. Well, they said it was a typhoon. Yeah. We'll take their word for it. Because yeah, there's definitely typhoons there. But big obvious snake never turned up in any of the traffic. Yeah, so I mean, when you, this is a month of the year during the cooler months of the year when you expect them to be most active. You've got, you know, half a dozen ecologists running around the bush looking for snakes, trapping, um, and just not seeing them for a month or six weeks at a time. And then, at, well, in those early survey years, we just weren't getting many mammals. You might get 30 mammals or 12 mammals in a month with 240 traps out of night. Uh, and then around 2011, we had a huge wet season. Uh, and that seemed to trigger something with the small mammals. Their numbers started to increase. And by 2013, the numbers were, yeah, well, that's an indication where you run out of, all the mammals who catch up there were processing, sexing, and um, we have to take them back out immediately after. But when you run out of bags and you're getting the nearly 50% capture rate, uh, turns out type air numbers aren't far behind because they went from being undetected to Finding one roadkill in 2013, 2014 are the most common large lapid on the property. And that continued for a couple of years until small mammal numbers just plummeted. But what that allowed us to do was really narrow it down because the wet tropics in far north Queensland, it's not so cut and dry up there about when they're mating. It almost seems like slightly later, but at least on feeder station where these uh, mammal booms seem to be very patchy, just like they're mostly restricted to um, volcanic soils and black soils, but more, that makes sense, more fertile soils. Um, can, you know, in other parts of Kimberley where you get high rainfall, so Mitchell Plateau and Prince Regent, they've got mammals all the time. Taipans are quite common across sandy substrates there, but uh, once you get out of the savannah, which is what a lot of the top end is in the Northern Territory, uh, it's mostly restricted to those uh, those heavier soils, and that's what we found. The typhans were abundant on those heavy soils, triggered by the coldest couple of weeks of the year to, to become really active and, and travel around. And Chris, thankfully, took on some of that information because when I lived there, there was only, what was there, Dane, like a dozen records of coastal typhans? Uh, and all. Yeah, there's bugger all. They were just showing up sporadically here and there. There was rumours of them out the back of Litchfield. Um, and Chris yeah. got stuck into that. So I ba basically uh, took 
I, uh, you know, you, you look at the literature and you, uh, you sort of looking for locations and I noticed Dane had written a little note about a, a, a coastal Taipan with a toad in its belly and it came from this road and I was like, well, this one has got to be a few more. Uh, so I took the sort of information that we had learned from looking for Taipans in North Queensland uh, and Brendan's information from the Kimberley. We needed a Taipan photo for, for the book and really like through, throughout the whole uh, book, we were, we were trying to get photos of the animal in the NT, which uh, for many species was actually quite tricky. Um, but yeah, so like taipans, common in another state, but not necessarily common in the NT. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I, I said, where did they find their taipan with the toad in its belly? Oh, it's on that road. And I drove out there. And as soon as I drove out there, I was like, this looks like uh, the same sort of habitat we're finding taipans in. <laughs> in Cooktown in North Queensland. It's uh, sort of uh, floodplains um, intersected with rainforest creek lines through undulating hills. And I was like, I've got to come back out here on a cool morning and really go for it. And you know, I went out a bunch of times and saw very little in the way of taipans, but eventually I had a cool enough morning and I found this. Uh, clearly two large snakes battling on the road uh, and just attract. And I followed this for 700 metres uh, until they disappeared. And uh, you can see the ventral scale slides. And, you know, I couldn't be certain they were taipans, but I was like, this is, these are taipans, I'm sure of it. Uh, I'm just going to stick to my guns and I'm keep coming out. And uh, it wasn't too much later than that. We cracked them and we started getting taipans uh, in the top end. And we managed to get our photos of taipans. Uh, we got juvenile ones and uh, yeah, so we, we kind of took the knowledge from elsewhere, replicated it in the NT, and managed to find this like holy grail, uh, difficult species to find. Um, and it was, yeah, it was nice. It was nice to be able to put a photo of a Taipan in the NT book because you'll talk to a lot of people that have been uh, <coughs> snake in the in the NT for a long time, and they'll say, "There's no Taipans up here," but yeah, there, there is. They're just patchy, and uh, they they take some uh, finicky. Um, herping to, to figure out. And they just might not always be there. Mm. Like if the mammals aren't there and the mammals boom patchily as well, you just might not have taipans there for a few years or not in really detectable numbers. So mm. I could talk about taipans and stuff all Everyone that. wants to hear about this. Yeah. <laughs> so we thought we would just touch on <clears throat> the Barkley Table Lamb. A lot of people that go herping through the Northern Territory like to stop in there. A, if you're coming from Queensland, you have to drive through it, and B, it's just an awesome place. That's what it looks like most of the time. It's brown, <laughs> desolate looking. Um, not always. <laughs> uh, sorry. So, Barkley Tableland is, go, is basically starting here, this light patch down into uh, northwest Queensland. It's dominated by Mitchell grass, it's sort of clayish soils, cracking soils, and essentially treeless. Um, and because of that, you just have, a, well, you've got a fair few endemics uh, and some pretty spectacular reptiles that live through the area. Uh, but at the same time, that featureless landscape makes it quite difficult to, to target anything. So it's, these are some of the main targets. Uh, you've got speckled brown snakes, Ingram's brown snakes, Barkley death adders, uh, you know, black soil whip snakes, fences monitors, and to notice Jonah, which is what most people go there for. Wow. <laughs> so herping with Barkley, it's just a soul crushing, you know, it, it does actually make you question your life choices. Because I've done a lot of trips down there and most of them are pretty fruitless. You might get a speckled ground snake or a whip snake here and there, but you have to work quite hard for it. And it has taken a lot of time on the black soil to kind of get a feel for what might be the best thing to do when you're out there. Birds like this go for 300 kilometres. Yeah, there. that's it's not, not <laughs> it's not just like a 25 kilometre stretch of road cruising, it's 600 kilometres from one, like in a lap, it's, uh, yeah, it's full on. <laughs> and it's a brutal I forgot me at this. <laughs> on top of not finding snakes, you're often dealing with just <laughs> flies or mosquitoes. It's great fun.
So you would imagine that getting out on the black soil when it is flooding is going to be amazing. So this was 2014 in late March. Me and Gary Bass at Gasmo, some of you might have bumped into along the way, uh, decided to do a trip out there. Um, we spent three nights and days just going our hardest, looking for anything we could find. We saw a couple of whip snakes which quickly shot off. Uh, one thing that turns out flooding is really good for, it actually looked like fog dam out there, the amount of birds and just flood waters, was Delma Tincta, a little legless lizard. The, the roads were absolutely covered in them. There was busted, you know, big birds walking down the road, just peeking them off. Um, but I think the problem was that there's so much water that every, all the snakes were just dispersed across the plains. There's no reason for them to be congregated. So after a few nights, we thought, bugger it, let's go further south. At least we'll be in reach of the sand plain if the black soil's not happening down there. Uh, and we found, it, well, oasis. Oasis. So <laughs> basically what we've got here is an area that has popped uh, a lot of rain because although it's semi-arid, it's got some monsoonal influence. So most wet seasons, it will get get uh, flooding rains out there. Um, we've got an area here that had been, I guess, flooded at some point, or at least caught a lot of rain, and the water has retracted into these little channels. Just It's just undulating plains. You can't even see it there. So no. Yeah. So the only reason we actually stopped was that we found a dead, a dead speckled brown on the road and a dead uh, black soil whip snake within about 100 metres, and there was a lot of black kites in the area, and we thought, well, something going on here, let's come back tomorrow morning when it's not so hot and we'll see how we go. And the place was just alive. There was actually, in two mornings we found 103 speckled brown snakes, 102 of those were on foot. So we only saw one cross the road because one side of the road had all this nice uh, sort of semi-flooded grassland uh, the other side is bone dry, and the real draw card was that Cyclorana culturopi, he's a knife footed frog, had just bred in enormous numbers. There was just thousands of little metamorph frogs around. Um, there was water holding frogs, Cyclorana platycephala. Um, everything was just eating Cyclorana culturopi. There's this frog screaming everywhere. <laughs> there's birds eating frogs, there's little eagles amongst the black kites. And didn't see one bird touch a snake. Even though a lot of these speckled brown snakes, are, they average quite small. Um, I guess why would you go for something kind of dangerous when there's frogs in just huge abundances? But it was, it was quite amazing. Um, and just seeing how they behave, they're, they behave like a black snake. They're quite semi-aquatic. Amongst those, we found two Ingram's brown snakes. So we've got a juvenile and an adult there. Um, Again, fairly semi-aquatic when we found that adult, which was you know, a metre and a half long, it immediately went into this little channel of water and it stirred up all the mud. And then we just didn't see it for another couple of minutes and we panicked and thought that it's somehow snuck out. But no, it was just curled up underwater on the bottom. And you just don't really, I'd never heard of that sort of behaviour, particularly in brown snakes. Um, it was, yeah. It was pretty amazing just watching them forage and, and, and you know, the channels are full of huge cyclorana tadpoles and they're eating, eating the frogs all over the place. Um, Chris had a similar experience. So it does just seem like you want to be there after the first set of rains have been there. After multiple rains and it seems like the frogs are already done. Um, but Chris got this video. Uh, you can hear Etty and Little Fair and Nick Bulk in the background. I don't know if the sound's working though. Oh no, it's, it's the best part. part. <laughs> you can do the voice over. No, I won't be doing that. What? Oh. Yeah, so we, we just replicated the same thing that Brendan found a few years later, nearly to the day, uh, the same time of year, but we found the same thing, just uh, water retracting uh, frogs metamorphosing en masse and every couple of metres uh, a brown snake or a whip snake uh, feeding on those on those frogs. It, uh, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> like the landscape that's usually so desolate seeing is high abundance of snakes and I guess they're more congregated because of the frogs and they follow the water in. Uh, 
so yeah, there's Cycler and a platycephala eating a coltropes. Um, interestingly, like we, when you come up to a speckled brown snake, they tend to have this very thrashing sort of defensive display, and a couple of them were so full of frogs that they just started regurgitating. Uh, we did not see any platycephala being eaten or regurgitated. We thought that was fairly interesting. Everything was just eating the knife-footed frogs. <laughs> so, yeah, just, I mean, if you do happen to do a trip across the Barkley, there's no one spot. I'm sure these things probably happen more regularly in certain spots that hold the water, you know, for the right amount of time. But just keep an eye out for things like, well, big swarms of black kites. I think most times people see it, they assume that there's something dead out there. But they're also hunting frogs and snakes are hunting frogs. So, uh, yeah, it's just worth, you know, not just focusing on the reptiles, but looking for other things that might indicate reptiles being there. And get out of the car and walk. Yeah, get out of the car, because if we just drove, we would have seen one step of brown snake. Um, so the arid zone, obviously, is an amazing place. Uh, even if you're not finding reptiles, you're finding tracks in the dunes. Uh, this actually isn't in the territory, it's just across the border on the Sandy Blight Junction track. We've got the Rista Ips going that way, the Rista Vermicularis, we've got blind snake tracks crossing that, and knob-tailed geckos walking over the top of it, just in this little, tiny little square. Uh, but we've done quite a few trips out to the arid zone, uh, trying to validate records and, and look for species that we think should be there, but haven't actually been recorded in the Northern Territory. And like Chris said, the, the, Arab, oh, the Northern Territory, it's just a remote place. Um, so there's just a lot of difficulties in getting out to these areas. It's, a, it's expensive, fuel's expensive. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a challenge, plus you're dealing with a lot of um, private land or indigenous protected lands. You can't just go out and walk wherever you want. Uh, these are some obviously you know, very common targets for people going out um, to the Southern Northern Territory. Uh, and because of that, people overlook all, well, a lot of smaller species and, and less spectacular species, I suppose. Um, and yeah, the Southern Northern Territory is just, it's in desperate need of more attention uh, to find out exactly what lives there, where they live, and so on. Uh, so yeah, searching for overlooked species, a few reasons why they're probably overlooked. Things like Jan's banded snakes and things, you know, they're quite widespread, but there's bugger all records in the Northern Territory. There's confusion, um, there's a lot of misidentifications in records, like if you look on the Atlas of Living, Living Australia, the smoke laps birth hold by records pretty much mirror anomalous. There's not really a need, uh, I don't understand why that would happen ecologically. Um, so there's, I think, a lot of misidentifications. Uh, and we just want to go out and test some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, I've already listed a bunch of these things. Uh, on top of all that, some of these species are just hard to find, blind snakes and things. You can't just go out and go, right, I'm going to find this species where I want to find it. You have to be out there just spending time and hoping you get it. Uh, and that's the example there, which is Anelios centralis, a centralian blind snake for a long time was assumed just to be endemic to like the McDonald Ranges bioregion. I think it was actually Glenn that spent some time looking at North and South Australian specimens and going, right, this is centralis as well. Uh, and then we got one in the Southern Northern Territory, Jordan Mulder and I. Um, and the soil type it was on is you know, actually distributed between uh, the McDonald Ranges and the southern or the, the northern South Australia population. So chances are they occur all the way through, just patchily, and people don't, well, herpers don't go to the Northern Territory to spend time <coughs> in these random patches of mulga shrubland away from ranges where they get the more spectacular species. Um, so yeah, it's just, it can be quite difficult to know whether you've got these disjunct populations, whether they're correctly mapped, or the areas in between are just lacking, you know, extensive surveys. Uh, another thing, another thing we had to spend a bit of time doing was um, 
finding all these small brown stinks and things and trying to show some variation amongst the species. As an example, um, Problepharus reginae, males, females and juveniles look quite different. Uh, and it took, took a bit of time to get, I actually didn't get all these photos in time for the book, so I've had to pull photos from other areas, but, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll just say we spent a very long time trying to capture the uh, intraspecific variation within species. And initially we, uh, very naive, thought we could have four photos per species in our book. And then like, as we went through, we're like, we don't actually need four species, uh, four photos per species. Uh, some species, two would be enough. And we submitted a book with between two and six photos per species. Binos geckos obviously had the most photos. Oh, that's what people want to see. <laughs> um, and uh, about a year after we submit, submitted the book, uh, Saro got back in touch with us and said, your book's 130 pages over the limit and you're going to have to cut it back. We initially thought, should we uh, do some taxonomic vandalism and lump uh, a bunch of blind snakes into a single species. Um, but instead, we decided we had no choice. Uh, or just get rid of turtles. <laughs> uh, instead, what we had to do was remove uh, 260 photos, which we painstakingly... It was made. actually devastating to do that. Like, not only to lose that for the quality of the book, but a lot of people went to a lot of effort to provide us photos. Uh, and we well, that, and we had to harass a lot of people a lot of to send us those photos and then to not get to use them in the book. It's that was pretty sad actually. Um, we'll see what we can get in the second edition. But we did retain as much in interest specific variation as we could. Uh, yeah, so a few examples of species that are just infrequently found in the Northern Territory and, and for a few different reasons. Delmar australis, uh, you know, probably a complex and there's, there's a few populations of them. Um, in the Northern Territory, although the maps show them being quite widespread, they're very patchy within that. We don't know if they occur in between these sort of isolated records, so I've had to just treat them as, as though they do occur all throughout it. But like I got this Delma, maybe a kilometre north of the South Australian border on top of the Musgrave Range under a clump of spinifex. Um, I don't, I know of one other person, so Greg Fife provided a photo of an adult Delma Australis from uh, the Dome Range, but they're just very patchy, hard to come by. They're not in areas where people just stumble onto them on the road. Sort of mentioned giant band snakes already. They're widespread through, you know, a lot of the uh, southwestern Australia from you know central South Australia across to the west coast so when you do get the chance to go to the Northern Territory why would you bother looking for it there um, so that's yeah I guess that's why they just overlook there there's and I think there was one other photo also Greg Fife's photo from the Northern Territory but it was a very old photo uh, and you know Larissa Timida I don't know why more people don't look for them but yeah, people just don't put the time in to find these small brown skinks. So uh, we're just left scratching our head going, right, where do these things actually occur? What habitats are they in? Um, and we just had to do our best to find them ourselves. The other thing is, though, that the NT is just incredibly under survey. There must have been 30 species in the book where there's records within two to 10 kilometers, the NT border, along the South Australian border, mm -hmm. along the South, South uh, West Queensland or the Western Australian border. And the records are not replicated despite the bioregions being widespread yeah. through the NT, just because of the lack of survey effort and how difficult it is to get into these remote parts of the NT. There's no roads, there's, uh, there's just cattle station uh, properties, but there's also no there must, it's not the same impetus to survey. Like the South Australian Museum provide all these records just all literally the South Australian border. less than a kilometre from the border. <laughs> like, but they won't. Do I they, guess they don't have to show that they're not. But uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, we've added, you'll see, we've added a bunch of photos in the book of species or profiles in the book of species that haven't actually been recorded in there, uh, and. We armed and out about that, but we thought it's best to have them in there, even if they might not occur there 
at least if someone finds them, they won't just assume it's the closest looking, you know, if we provide them a way to identify it, then we might be able to confirm whether they're or We did try to rectify it, but go to the next slide. So, Larista vermicularis uh, is one that I'm extremely confident occurs in the Northern Territory. I've found them a couple of times on the Sandy Blight Junction track, 20 kilometres west of the Northern Territory border. I'm going to jump over here, about there. And all this area, so they're in these, on the dune crests, goes more or less 200 kilometres into the Northern Territory, mostly uninterrupted. They're there, it's, but that's indigenous protected area. And if you're going, you know, if we're out on a trip and we go, oh, actually, we should probably look for the, the rest of Vermicularis, you know, near Kaltaka Jara. Well, you can't just do it. You need permits, you need to do it with the Central Land Council, and it's a, basically a headache to get into these areas. Um, and on the Northern Territory side, those public roads don't actually hit any suitable habitat. Um, so it is quite frustrating in that regard. Uh, so, you know, we've obviously added these into the book. Another one was Larista speciosa. I'd written that species profile and said it probably occurs in the Northern Territory where the Musgrave range and, and potentially in those ranges in the, in the south there around Kaltakajara, they might extend into that area. Um, thankfully, after doing that, did a trip down to Southern Northern Territory and got permission to explore some of these cattle stations. Um, and the first day we were there, we got Larista speciosa, a kilometre north of the South Australian border, but it's an official record for the Northern Territory. Um, so we did spend a lot of time looking at, uh, you know, the satellite imagery going, right, they occur here, this looks quite similar. Why wouldn't they occur there? Um, I think for the most part, we've covered most species that haven't been recorded in the Northern Territory uh, that should occur there. Um, we realise from the last couple of them? days we probably should have added Demanzia flagellatio, but you know, we'll worry about that when someone finds one. At least they're recognisable. So yeah, it was great to, to confirm that uh, species that occur in the Northern Territory and also to get... First uh, field guide photos of them. Yeah, well, the only photos available for this species, I'm not sure if there's... I think the lizard was alive, but it looked like it was sitting on a desk in a so in the museum. Dead. <laughs> Probably it's dead. A photo of it, I'm just back it is a very <laughs> easy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, look, all records help anyone going through the Northern Territory herping or whatever. If you think you find something interesting, lodge the record. Um, some of these species could potentially be sensitive. Um, to disturbance, or, you know, habitat destruction from, you know, people going and looking in a uh, pretty, you know, shocking way. Uh, so it's good to put a buffer on the exact coordinate if you are going to lodge it on something like iNaturalist. Um, but at least your name will be there if someone needs to get in touch with you to confirm the record or discuss things further. Well, that's a possibility then. Um, it's great just for the broader understanding, also for. Um, threatened species assessments, those records are incredibly important um, for habitat modelling and all the rest of it. Uh, it also just saves people like us a huge headache where, and, and a hassle when we're putting these field guides together. For all I know, there's been a dozen people that have seen Larissa speciosa in the Northern Territory and no one said a thing. <laughs> we are looking for them all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Look, there's been a lot of people, and, and we're, we're not naive. We realise that we might not have been the best people possible to write this field guide, but it seemed like we were the only people that were actually going to do it. Now it makes sense why no one else... <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we understand it now. Um, but we had a lot of help from a lot of people along the way, uh, so we thought we'd sort of take the time here just to... Too, too many to name everyone entirely. Um, so if you want to uh, see your name in text, you've got to buy the book to find out for sure. But there's a few people that we needed to make specific mention of. So Tom Parkin, who was supposed to be here tonight but decided to stay home, um, <laughs> he's been herping with us for a long time 
and we spent a lot of time in the Northern Territory together. He was living up there. A lot of time harassing mangrove snakes and things. Um, and he was there when we did that trip down the Sandy Blight, found Larissa Vermicularis. So he's, yeah, he really helped us along the way. So we thought we'd mention his name. Stephen Zazaya. Um, Painfully American. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately American, but you know, incredible in the field. Uh, we spent a huge amount of time in remote areas across Northern Australia with Stephen. Um, and he really did go out of his way to help wherever he could uh, when we needed it. Henry Cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I haven't spent a huge amount of time with Henry in the Northern Territory. I worked it out. We spent, I don't know, like 13 months in the Kimberley together. And it's not just like it's doing standardised herp survey, it's something like a thousand hours of herp, of standardised herp surveys, plus spotlighting, plus all the free range herping we like to do. Uh, and I think through that, we, um, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time just working out how reptiles operate in northern savannas and escarpments and all the rest of it. And that helped a lot in, you know, it just translates to the Northern Territory and finding those species. So that's um, Jordan Mulder. <laughs> you were talking about oh, Jordan? Yeah, he's Jordan Mulder. He's a, a young uh, uh, electrician that moved up to the NT, desperate to find reptiles, and we couldn't have honestly asked for a better person he's, to, to be uh, our sidekick on many of her... He's machines. a machine, and like he's gone above and beyond. Uh, as Jordan and I... Jordan was with me when we got Larista speciosa, that was a central photo down the bottom there is on top of the Musgrave range uh, where we've got Delma Australis. Um, yeah, he's, he's the sort of, like it's unusual to find someone who's, who says, right, I'm gonna go on a herb trip and doesn't go to any nice looking areas. He'll just stop at a random patch of savannah and go, I wonder what lives here. And he'll find something interesting like Tympanocryptus and um, having him help us along the way and also being able to go in and check museum specimens when we wouldn't we couldn't get up to the Northern Territory as uh, just invaluable you couldn't ask for anyone better also being an excellent photographer definitely helped yeah. uh, the field you see a lot of his photos in the book yeah. and uh, Etienne Littlefair the Englishman with a lot of uh, enthusiasm for <laughs> freshwater turtles uh, we wouldn't have had the photos that we didn't have without him I've done many a mission in the mud, in uh, the Barclay Tableland, and uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's been a great friend in the field. Uh, and Brenton Von Takash, he uh, came to live with Alana and I in Darwin as he finished his PhD, uh, to, and we said, you can stay with us for six weeks, we've got a spare room. He stayed there for 18 months, and uh, <laughs> did a bunch of herbing trips with me, but really was just a sounding board for me to, uh, uh, exclaim and uh, vent my frustration out on while reading Glenn Storr's descriptions of various tenotas that were so vague they were totally useless to us um, and, and trying to decipher uh, the best way is to make a user-friendly field guide so uh, I definitely have to thank those two um, but more than anyone uh, I have to thank Alana my lovely wife who I moved to Northern Australia for, I moved up to Cairns uh, to, to be with Alana and, uh, and then got a PhD in Darwin and tricked her into moving back to Darwin after she left Darwin because she thought there was nothing uh, left there to offer her. Uh, but uh, Alana has, uh, uh, yeah, she's gone around the territory with me looking for reptiles. She's um, put up with me uh, being absent while looking for reptiles and being absent even while at home, uh, while frustrated and thinking about reptiles. Um, and so, yes, I, I can't uh, thank her enough. She was my muse uh, for the book and I appreciate her dearly. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> but I could mirror a lot of what Chris said for my wife, Nat. She's put up with a lot. 
Um, <laughs> people who devote their life to reptiles are pretty special. <laughs> the best reasons. Uh, but yeah, she's put up with a lot on field trips as well. Uh, yeah, a lot of holidays, which is essentially just looking for reptiles. Um, campsites that pretty crap, but you might get a Larista there at night or something. So, um, yeah, thanks for putting up with all of that and, and for us while we're writing the book and sort of get outside of where cane toads are common. And blue tongues as well. Blue tongues, yeah. Sorry. And and yellow spotted monitor. As, as you move, move further south, um, those those species that are affected become more common. But there, there is this attitude in the Northern Territory that when cane toads, cane toads came through, everything disappeared. And it's just not the case. It's some, There's a handful of species that have been really hammered by toads. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of things uh, haven't been impacted directly. So some things have been impacted indirectly and have increased because large predators have declined. I, I think people just started taking notice of everything they saw. And when you think back, it's like, oh, I used to see frillies all the time. But you might not realise you just saw them at certain times of the year. Um, so when I moved up there, people told me that frill necks used to be everywhere. I'd been up there before toads or like, before toads had pushed right through Darwin, and to be fair, it's not a long time to, mm. to compare it to, but I don't think there's any real data to support that they've declined at all, and I certainly don't think it's because of toads. Uh, if they have, it's, if anything, it's fire regimes. Um, Road casualties in the suburbs, and cats and dogs. Yeah, yeah also things like Merton's water monitors and Mitchell's <coughs> water monitors have been put on the threatened species list. Uh, because of a certain paper. Um, Merton's water monitors are still one of the most common gatwainers out there. If you go walking along a freshwater creek, you're pretty much guaranteed to see a Merton's water monitor. We, in, well, in the Kimberley, Toads got up to doing and Theta Station, we were monitoring uh, in 2016 and 17. Merton's and Mitchell Eye are as common as they've ever been. Um, and it's not to say that these species didn't decline in those study areas, but I don't think it's been a widespread decline through all niches that they inhabit. They were mostly surveying one major river system, and there's, there's other potentials it could be, even just the time of year that they were surveying, it might have been pushed further into the dry season because it was related to it. Sorry, I'm getting <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's impacts of toads, but not everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. I'll add something. Yep. If 
Have you ever, if you let Jordan know that Paul Horner was an electrician, that's why he knows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. actually, yeah. Paul Horner, it was, it was great to have the support of people like Paul, now that you bring him up. He, um, he was supported from the work go, he edited the skin uh, chapter for us. Um, yeah, actually, we had a lot of support. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of people that we, we, we need to thank for their contributions and mentorship and uh, just friendship along the way. Like we can't, yeah, we can't We're talk about it at all. But yeah, Paul Horner wrote the full word for us and did a very good job. But yeah, there's <laughs> absolutely nothing wrong with electricity state. <laughs> <Right. laughs> okay, put your hands together. Thank you. 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 Thank you.